Mrs. Grant nodded sulkily and leaned against the Central American war canoe. Her shoulders were on a level with those of the papier-mâché paddler, but broader by far. Looking at them, Mr. Grant wondered for a moment if the special exhibit would work. Could it succeed on a woman so large, so strong, so set in her ways? He hoped so. Failure would be ridiculous. Welcome to our museum, the attendant said. I believe this is the first time we've had the pleasure, Mrs. Grant. Haven't been here since I was a kid, Mrs. Grant said, stifling a yawn behind a large hand. Mrs. Grant is not particularly interested in the storied past, Mr. Grant explained, leaning on his cane. My work in orthonology leaves her quite unimpressed. However, she has agreed to accompany me to the special exhibit. A special exhibit, sir? The attendant asked. He consulted a notebook. I don't believe. Here is my invitation, Mr. Grant said. Yes, sir. The attendant examined the card carefully, then handed it back. I hope you enjoy it, sir. The special exhibit hasn't been shown often. I think that Dr. Carver and his wife were the last to view it. Of course, Mr. Grant said. He knew the mild, balding Carver quite well and Carver's thin, nagging, red-haired wife was a good friend of Mrs. Grant. The exhibit must have been effective, for Carver had been perceptibly more cheerful at work. The special exhibit was, of course, a far more effective problem-solver than marriage counseling, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, or even simple forbearance. It was uniquely the museum's project. The museum liked to have its employees happy and contented for only then could they serve science properly. But aside from that, the special exhibit was educational and filled a distinct gap in the museum's program. The general public had not been informed of it, for the general public was exceedingly conservative in the face of scientific necessity. But that was as it should be, Mr. Grant told himself. The attendant fished a key from his pocket. Be sure to return it to me, sir, he said. Grant nodded and led Mrs. Grant down the hall, past glass cases inhabited by Siberian tigers and giant pandas. A water buffalo stared glassy-eyed at them, and a family of Axis deer continued grazing in eternal peace. "'How long is this going to take?' Mrs. Grant asked. "'Well, not long at all,' Mr. Grant said, remembering the special exhibit was noted for its swiftness. "'I've got some deliveries coming,' Mrs. Grant said and some important things to do. Leading her past a muntjac and a spotted chevreton, Mr. Grant allowed himself to wonder momentarily what those important things might be. Mrs. Grant's interests seemed to center in television by day and motion pictures by night. Of course, there were the deliveries. Mr. Grant sighed. They were so obviously ill-matched to think that he, a small, rather delicate fellow with a large mind, would voluntarily marry a woman of such heroic proportions and meager mentality. But it happened to others, Dr. Carver, for example. Mr. Grant smiled wanly at the fiction of attracting opposites at the entire romantic principle. Hadn't his work in orthonology taught him anything? Did the yellow-rumped siskin mate with the condor? a single wild fling. How much better, he thought, if he had been content to join the French Foreign Legion, spend his inheritance in riotous living, or take to voodoo. Such ventures could, in time, be lived down. But marriage? Never. Not with Mrs. Grant as comfortable as she was. Unless, of course, the special exhibit. This way, Mr. Grant murmured, leading her down an unexpected corridor or concealed between glass cases.